To preface this story, I'd like to educate my non-Hmong listeners about what the blessing, ceremony, and soul call is. They are not a huge part of this story, so I'm not going into detail on what they are, as there are videos and people that can explain the processes better than I can. The blessing, or what the Hmong called Kite, is a celebration in which friends and family come together to tie white strings on their loved ones' wrists, wishing or blessing them with health, luck, and prosperity. It's sometimes accompanied by a soul call. There are different reasons for this, with the most common ones being when a really sick person has recovered from their illness, when a newborn is first brought home from the hospital, or during a wedding. There is usually lots of people and alcohol in some cases. The hupli, which literally translates to spirit call, is a ritual that is done at the very least with a bowl of uncooked rice, an egg, and a couple of burnt incense. Most times, it also includes two chickens, a male and female. It's a process of essentially calling a person's soul back into their physical bodies. The purpose of the soul call is that the Hmong believe a person's soul can wander off on its own for various different reasons. In some cases, the person can become sick if their spirit lingers too long without returning to its body. An example is if something or someone caused that person to become extremely frightened or spooked. There are more to the rituals, but that's generally what I wanted to cover. Now let's get on with the story. Marla's family attended her uncle's blessing ceremony, or kite. There was lots of delicious food. They even had her favorite, ginger beef soup. There were lots of people at the gathering, even cousins she hadn't seen in a few months. She spent the day catching up and playing with all her cousins. Marla also made time to play and feed her cousin's dog even when the other kids didn't pay it any attention. It was somewhat of a tradition to her. Marla always wanted a dog. She didn't care which one or what color. She just wanted one of her own. Later that day, as Marla's stepdad, Vang, drove them home, she decided to ask her parents if she could have a dog. Um, could I possibly get a dog? It was something I've been thinking about for a while now, Marla asked timidly. You know that's a lot of work. You have to feed it, walk it, bathe it, train it, and make sure all of its shots are up to date, her mom said. That isn't too bad. I'm sure I can handle it, responded Marla. I don't have an issue with it, as long as you're responsible, her mom said, knowing the decision is ultimately up to her husband. No, Fang said, still keeping his eyes on the road. Marla wanted to ask why, but she hesitated. Her stepfather isn't someone to be questioned. She learned that the hard way once, and he has made plenty of examples of her mother. In the back of her mind, she'd already known the answer, so it was no surprise. Marla spent a lot of time in the backyard when her mom wasn't home. One day, when Marla was out there playing, a little black chihuahua showed up in their yard. It must have gotten through the gaps in the fence, she thought. It didn't have a tag, so she figured it was a stray. From that day forward, Marla decided to adopt him. The dog was a male, so she named him Buddy. At first, he was a little shy, but as time passed, he started to warm up to Marla. She was excited, but knew she'd have to keep it a secret, and started to sneak food for him. Buddy showed up one day when Marla and her mom were playing out in the yard. She was off work that day. Marla didn't think she had to worry about her mom finding out, so she introduced her dog to her mom. Hey mom, this is Buddy. Hi Buddy, mom said, eyeing the dog suspiciously. Then she asked, Marla, where did you find him? I found him in the yard a couple weeks ago. He just wandered in. Buddy's a really good dog, Marla replied. I don't know if your dad will let you keep him. He doesn't have to know. It'll be our little secret, Marla smiled. We don't even know if he's had his shots, and your dad will be very upset. He won't even know. He'll be too busy tending to his chickens, Marla said, ignoring the point about the shots. He still needs his shots, or else he'll get you sick. He won't get me sick. Marla picked up Buddy and rubbed her face against him. He lapped at her cheek. Marla, put him down. Her mom snatched Buddy from her and set him on the ground. She grabbed Marla's arm and attempted to drag Marla inside, all the while Buddy followed them. Stop, let go of me, she shrieked 
as she fought her mom off and scooped Buddy up. She ran away from her, crying. Marla, you don't know what disease that dog is carrying. I don't care. The hell are you crying about? A voice yelled out. Marla froze upon recognizing the familiar voice, and her heart dropped. Vang walked over to them with his gaze locked on Buddy. What did I say when you asked if you could have a dog? Marla remained silent, looking at the ground to avoid Fang's eyes as she held on to Buddy. His fur stood up, then he started yapping and snarling at Marla's stepdad. I see, you don't listen to me. From the corner of her eye, she could see him glance at her mom, then back at Marla. Let me see that mutt. Vang, just leave it alone, her mom pleaded. I'm not talking to you, he pointed at Marla's mom. I was talking to her. Now let me see that mutt. No! Marla yelled, holding Buddy tighter as she backed away. He was still barking and growling. At that instant, her stepdad lunged in. Mom grabbed his arm, but he struck her off, then struck her across the face with the back of his hand. Marla made a run for it, but Vang caught her by the hair and yanked her backwards. She screamed in agony, tears streaming down her cheeks, all the while Buddy continued to snarl and bark. It felt like her scalp was being ripped from her skull. She lowered her arms as much as she could since her upper body was being pulled toward her stepdad's grip. Marla let go of Buddy, hoping he'd make a run for it, but he did not. Instead, he did the opposite. The whole ordeal happened in a span of about 30 seconds, but seemed longer. Marla heard a muffled growl, then Vang yelling in pain. The grip on her hair loosened. She spun around to see what was happening. Buddy had his jaws clamped down the back of Fang's ankle. He was tugging and shaking it violently. Fang vigorously tried to fight him off, but Buddy remained glued to his leg. Fang then lifted his leg into the air, and Buddy with it. Buddy lost his grip and dropped to the ground, landing on his side. At that moment, everything went quiet and time seemed to have stood still. Fang's face was twisted with rage, his brows furrowed and his mouth wide with gritted teeth as he wound back his leg like a soccer player in the middle of a penalty kick. Buddy was barely recovering. Marla dashed in to save him, but Mom grabbed her from behind with arms around her waist. She felt her feet leave the ground. Marla reached a hand and cried out for Buddy, but it was useless. She could do nothing but watch and cry helplessly as Vang launched the poor pup into the air. He crashed onto the hard concrete ground several feet away, then tumbled for an additional few more feet. Buddy was motionless. The last thing Marla saw before being carried away was Vang picking Buddy up by the back of his neck as he looked over at her. In that moment, she met his gaze, all of her fears and sadness overtaken by an intense hate for the man. She didn't know what Vang did to Buddy after she was brought inside, but she had no doubt he was dead. If there was any indication for how Vang treated his chickens or other animals he did not favor, then she hoped, but his death was swift. One time, she saw him strike one of his gamecocks after a disappointing sparring session with a blunt end of a hatchet. It was still alive and writhing in agony when he stuffed it into a trash bag. There were other incidents involving a cat that wandered into their garage and a pair of baby birds that fell from a nest. Each one met with a crueler and more gruesome end than the next. After he dealt with Buddy, Vang made sure Marla and her mom learned their lesson in obedience. What better tool than a folded over plastic coaxial cable? Vang made sure the lashings they received weren't anywhere people would see. He said it was done out of love, as he always did, and that they'd thank him one day. Love or not, it just felt wrong. Marla couldn't help think sometimes he was doing it for his own pleasure. Like those times he'd make her mom cry, saying the nastiest and most demeaning things to her. Her mom did a lot for the family. When she had to go to work, she always made sure there was something to eat before she left. Even then, Vang would starve Marla, saying, You are a whore, and a slut just like your mommy. Yet, Marla was never allowed to ask what she had done, otherwise she'd receive lashings. He also told Marla, If you ever tell anyone, I'll make sure you never see mommy again. She felt so helpless. Marla wished there was something she could do to help Mom, Buddy, and the other animals. Then she cried herself to sleep knowing she'd never see Buddy again, but mainly because Marla was upset at herself for not being able to help him. 
Marla dreamt she and her mom were holding hands walking through a field filled with flowers on a sunny day. They were tall pine trees and huge mountains in the backdrop. She could hear insects buzzing and birds chirping. They were flowers of various shapes, sizes, and colors. Marla saw roses, sunflowers, daisies, and many others she didn't know the names of, but all of them were pretty, if not prettier. All of a sudden, it got increasingly colder. Daytime turned into night. All the plant life started to wither and die, and the trees started to bald. Her sense of dread grew when Marla noticed her mom had vanished. At that moment, something rustled, then emerged from the waist-high thicket of flowers. It was Buddy, or what looked like a shadowy figure of him. Marla was so happy she cried tears of joy as she ran towards the dog. As Marla got closer, she noticed there was something very off about him. He wasn't his happy self, his tail did not wag, and he didn't hop around with joy. Buddy did not rush to embrace her, as she thought he would. He just stood there in silence. When Marla was within ten paces, she saw that part of Buddy's head and face was severely crushed with blood crusted all over him. One of his eyes was missing. The one that remained became a blaze like hot iron in the darkness. He snarled, then pounced at Marla, and she screamed. At that instant, she jumped out of her sleep in a cold sweat. She glanced at her phone. It was 5.47 a.m. She'd have to get up for school in a bit. Too terrified to sleep, Marla stayed up until her alarm came on, then she got out of bed to get ready for school. A week went by without incident. Then one night, as Marla was taking the trash out, Buddy appeared out of the darkness. He was in the same condition as he was in her dream. Marla was about to take off running, but her curiosity kept her from doing so. Happily panting, Buddy approached her, wagging his tail. Marla shuddered as she squatted and reached her hand out to him cautiously. Buddy sniffed her hand and licked it, relieving the tension between them. Even with his disfigurement, it was as if nothing happened. He acted like his normal self. Marla breathed a sigh of relief, then rubbed him behind the ears. Buddy welcomed it. Marla picked him up and held him tightly as she kissed him. He returned her affection. Marla smiled as a small tear trickled down her cheek. She had missed him so much. She did not know how it was possible that her dog had come back from the dead, but it didn't matter as long as they were together again. Marla brought Buddy into the house with her. Ever since then, strange things started happening inside their house. Marla snuck some food for Buddy, but he wouldn't eat. He would sniff at it, but wouldn't even touch it. She locked him inside her room, but somehow he was still able to get out. One night, Buddy knocked over the trash can in the kitchen. Vang accused her and she received a whipping for it. The next week, Buddy knocked over the trash bin and tore into the garbage while it was placed on the street. Marla was once again given a whipping and starved for a week. She couldn't explain how Buddy was getting out. She scolded him, but he wouldn't listen. It was almost as if Buddy did not care or didn't think she knew whenever he was causing trouble. After that incident, Buddy disappeared for a few nights. Then, late one night, when Marlon's mom was at work, Vane got into bed and noticed the bed was wet. The substance was warm, thick, and slippery, unlike water. Some parts were even sticky. Vane brought his hand to his nose and smelled it. The substance stunk of iron. He was suddenly reminded of the few times he dealt with nosebleeds. Vang used the light from his phone to inspect the bed. His heart sank upon the discovery. A chill crept down his spine, and Vang's heart rate accelerated. There next to him were half a dozen corpses of his chickens strewn about, bloody and partially eaten with most of the feathers still on them. His fear quickly turned into anger. He leapt out of bed and went for the light switch. Vang flipped the switch, but the darkness remained. He tried it again and again, but there was no change. He cursed. Outside his door, he heard barking, followed by something scurrying about. It sounded eerily familiar. Vang grabbed the pistol from the drawer of his nightstand. The feel of the gun in his hand gave him a new sense of courage. He cocked it, then stepped outside his bedroom with the pistol in one hand and his phone in the other. 
Fang used the light from the phone to guide him around the house. He tried the light switch in the living room, but like the one in the bedroom, it didn't work. The power must have gone out, he thought, but he'd have to check the breaker box in the basement just in case. Vang rushed into the kitchen when he heard a crash come from there. The trash can was toppled over, and there was a trail of trash leading from it through a door that led down a short set of stairs. There were two doors at the bottom. The one directly across and facing the entryway to the kitchen was surrounded by two walls forming a narrow pathway. That one led to the backyard. On one of the walls next to the door was the other door leading into the basement. The basement door was cracked open. Fang entered it, cautiously following the litter of trash down the stairs. The wooden stairs creaked as he started his descent. When he got to the third step from the top, a snarl came from behind him. His eyes widened and he froze. Before he could turn to see what it was, Fang was already tumbling down the stairs. With his gun going off midway, he landed hard on the concrete floor. His body lay there, twisted and contorted unnaturally, in a pool of blood. Vang couldn't move, and found it harder and harder to breathe as the warm wetness around his chest started to spread. His phone landed at an angle, pointing upwards toward the door from which he came. There at the top of the stairs was Marla in her sleeping gown, with dark dried blood and feathers spread throughout her mouth, cheeks, neck, and chest. She glared at him in contentment with a huge smile, her teeth painted with the same black and red gore as the rest of her. You bitch, Vang said as he took his last breath. <laughs>